one of the things when we look at red districts, a lot of people assume that red areas are just rural. And that's not, and because of gerrymandering, that's not always true. Also, when we look at people who are in red districts, they're black people, they're brown people, they're white people. And a lot of times we assume in those districts, they're just white conservative voters. And they're actually people who are representative of our party that are in those districts that don't have representation because no one runs. And so we've got to give our Democrats, our different demographics in these communities, an opportunity to have a say and who represents them. Hi, I'm James Johnson, graphic design specialist at NDTC. If you find this training helpful, please hit the like and subscribe button. And if you want to dive deeper into this topic, check out the description for more free campaign resources. Thanks for watching. All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. We have an all-star panel uh, this, uh, this evening in only an hour. And I know that seems like a long time, but uh, I, knowing the folks on this panel, uh, that is going to seem like it is no time at all. My name's Coleman Elridge. I am proud to be the chair of the Kentucky Democratic Party uh, and also an NDC, uh, NDTC trainer. Uh, and it is my privilege and, and honor to welcome you to our panel this evening. Uh, like I said before, we've got a, uh, a, a all-star panel, uh, but a few, few, uh, sorry, there, there was a, uh, there's a, there's a net or something that wants to be a future Democrat as well. Uh, there are a, a couple of things that uh, we wanted to, to point out before we get started. Uh, first of all, thank you for everyone that has been a part of uh, Build Blue Week. Uh, this has been a labor of love, we know, for our, uh, our staff at NDTC, uh, but you are why we do this and you are what makes this possible. Uh, so thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for being a part of it this evening as well as we talk about building blue in red districts, uh, which is something, look, I, I, I can speak from experience. Uh, you, you tell folks that you're the chair of the Kentucky Democratic Party, and the first thing they ask is, wait, they're, they're Democrats in Kentucky. And absolutely, we are everywhere, and we are, we are uh, building a party uh, that can be anywhere and compete everywhere. Uh, and so what we want to do this evening is just have a conversation and, and uh, hopefully you can glean from the experts that we have this evening uh, what it's like uh, to uh, be on the ground, the conversations that we have day in and day out, not only with one another, uh, but with our colleagues and folks uh, on the ground in the states that we are privileged to work in. So again, I, I want to thank you for uh, being a part of this evening. And with that, we will turn it over. What I, what I want to do is to open this up first uh, and have our panelists introduce themselves and uh, give a little bit of background as to where they come from. And then we will get started uh, in on some questions. If you have questions, please feel free to, to uh, put those questions in our Q&A box. We will uh, have our NDTC team monitoring that. I will try to monitor it as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we can get to as many of your questions as possible and, uh, and uh, be a resource to you as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to go by who I see kind of on my screen first. So uh, this could be trouble for us all, but Trav, Oh, right. the floor is yours. Right, right. I can never go before uh, the gentle chairwoman uh, Barnes. Chairwoman Barnes, it is all yours first. I can't do it. Thank you, my friend. Uh, hi, folks. I'm LaVora Barnes. I am the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party. Um, I came to party work, frankly, from campaign work. I um, work, worked hard on many, many campaigns and uh, had a dream of a kind of state party who could support the kind of candidates I was um, working with all over the state of Michigan and came here in 2015 first as an executive director and then as chair in 2019 to, to, to build that kind of party. Um, it's been a labor of love. I have enjoyed 
I was just about to tell you all I've enjoyed every minute of it. That's not true. I've enjoyed a great deal of the work that I have done. I am very proud of the work that we have done here. I, um, we've worked with NDTC for years. We've had folks come in and help train. So thank you all for the work that you do. Thank you all for participating in this terrific program and learning what it means to run campaigns and run for office up and down the ticket. I'm thrilled to be here with fellow state party folks. This is some of my favorite conversation is when state party folks get together. Um, someday you should be in a room with us when we're in person um, and just listen to what happens and watch what happens. Um, it is a joy um, to have these partners and these brothers in arms um, in doing what we do. And you should know, we talk to each other, we check in, um, we share best practices because that's what makes each of us better and stronger. And so we're happy to be here to have this conversation and share some of those practices with all of you. So I'm thrilled, I'm excited to get the questions when they come. And um, Coleman, you want me to bounce it back to Trav? Yes, Madam Chair. Let's it back do that. to Trav. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and, and Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here from South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> I like to tell everybody I'm an accidental party chairman. Uh, I did not go looking to be a party chairman. I spent most of my life running campaigns in places, as Jamar will tell you, that most people don't want to run campaigns, um, but somebody had to do it. And uh, it has been a unique experience, as, as the chairwoman from Michigan said. I don't know that I've loved every minute of it, but it has given me the opportunity to make great friends all across the country, and I value friends more than I do most anything. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we take the fight to our opponents, and we have forced them to do some things that they felt uncomfortable doing uh, in, in this state and in other parts of uh of the country and from a region's perspective. And I, I do believe uh, that one of the hardest things that we have to change is the psychology of not only our folks in South Carolina, but those folks who uh, have a perception of South Carolina, but have never been to South Carolina. And that's that sometimes is a perception uh, that is deserved and sometimes it is an unfair perception but it's still a psychology and a perception that we have to change. And, and the reason I mentioned it is because quite frankly, that was a fear that I had when I became chairman was whether or not we could put together the resources to be a viable party structure and uh, to, to create an organization that puts our candidates in a position to win. And it's an, it's an ever-changing process. And so I look forward to talking about that with you all tonight. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you want me to kick it to Jamar or Ben? Your, you choose. I'm going with Jamar. <laughs> I, think, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> but um, hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Jamar Brown. I am based in Austin, Texas. I am the co-executive director of the Texas Democratic Party. Um, I have been on this role, job for 60 days. Uh, so um, I am learning from all these great folks on this panel, um, but have years of experience working in campaigns, both electoral and also issue campaigns. Um, I'm proud to also be an NDTC trainer and trained um, several times. Um, and then also I serve as a Democratic National Committee member uh, representing the Young Democrats of America. And I think I saw some young Dems out there in the audience. And so thankful for you all being there. Coleman, that's how we met. Um, and Trav, we got to meet because I, we were running around South Carolina oh, trying to elect yeah. Democrats <laughs> um, in some of the oddest places, um, as Trav awesome. said. But, um, I got my involvement in politics um, in the early 90s. Uh, my grandmother was a school teacher in Charleston, South Carolina, and she was a Clinton delegate at the 92 convention. I could barely walk. But, <laughs> but um, I always tell folks I've been a Democrat for a long time, um, been able to work on various campaigns. I'm excited to be with you all because one of the things that's pivotal to us right now as a party is that we must compete everywhere in the country uh, to give people a voice, to give people an opportunity of leadership um, and to really change this country from the bottom up. And so excited to dig more into how we do that and not forgetting our red states and red campaigns, red, um, and red precincts, red counties. Um, we wanna make sure we build campaigns that engage everyone um, across our community. So um, I'll kick it off to you, Ben. Thank you so much, Jamar. Um, and thanks to all my fellow panelists. What an extraordinary group of people to be on here with um, and to the NDTC. In Wisconsin, we love the National Democratic Training Committee. Also, thank you so much for training folks here. Um, 
I am the, uh, I guess in year two and a half as chair of the Wisconsin Dems, I grew up in here in Wisconsin, actually in the house that I'm joining you from now, which I bought for my uh, parents. I'm raising my kids in, um, but worked in politics and media and activism across the country for about 20 years in between those two things. And I have to say, you know, Wisconsin is, is the most evenly divided state in the country. Four out of the last six presidential races came down to less than one percentage point. But if you go into the state, there are bright blue places and bright red places and purple places. And it's so gerrymandered that in the last election, our obsessive focus was stopping Republican supermajorities in our state legislature. So I spent a ton of time thinking about how to fight in you know, some very red, very tough state legislative districts to prevent the, the worst case scenario from happening. And I'm so excited to hear from, learn from my, my fellow panelists about um, how they're fighting and, and share whatever I can about uh, what we were able to do over these last few years here. Last few years here, midterm elections are tough. And I, I think we're all ready for a giant battle in 2022. Uh, but if you're here watching and, and here for the training today, it means you are ready to be part of that fight. And that for me is a source of tremendous hope and optimism. So I'm really excited about the conversation we're about to have, because if we don't run everywhere, then we're going to lose everywhere. And, and uh, taking on Republicans in the toughest places is how we win. Uh, back over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. As I said, this is an all-star panel. Uh, I, I'm a new state chair. I, I've been on for uh, about uh, seven months, and I, I will tell you whether it's uh, my fellow chairs or uh, our our executive directors and 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 staff. There is there is so much knowledge in, in our state parties, and so much passion in our state parties, and I hope you see that uh, just from the introductions. And we haven't even gotten started yet on, on the real tea. So uh, let's let's jump into it. Ben, you uh, you touched on something that I, I think is a really good place to start, which is you know, whether you are in a, a red state, a purple state, a blue state with, with red uh, uh, districts, uh, when, you, when you inherit a party, uh, whether it's at the staff level or uh, uh, at, at the leadership level, uh, what, what are some of the challenges uh, of, of trying to corral uh, uh, a party uh, as, as big as the Democratic Party? Uh, where we've got, you know, conservative, moderate, liberal, we've got to operate in, in red, purple, blue districts uh, in our state. Uh, talk about uh, the challenges uh, that you may inherit, that you may have inherited. And I guess the follow-up to that is, uh, how, how do you turn those uh, into positives? How, how do you how do you build uh, how do you build blue uh, in, in in districts and states like that? Ben, we'll start with you, and then we'll we'll kind of make our way back around. Uh, thank you. It's, it's such a great question, uh, Chair Elridge. And I will say, you know, we're a big tent party, and Democrats uh, are we're we're a diverse party. We're a party that represents rural folks and folks who live in cities and, and people who live in suburbs, you know, white, black, and brown and tribal nations. And for me, as when I came in as chair, that started with a ton of listening to folks across the state of Wisconsin and hearing about different kinds of challenges happening in different places, looking for through lines, but also really trying to understand the particular local challenges, which vary a lot from place to place. And through that, I wound up uh, you know, working with our organizing team here, deciding to make listening a core part of our whole strategy. So in the off year, what we do in, in 2019, what we're doing right now, we do statewide door-to-door -door canvases where we don't try to convince anyone of anything. We just go to people's houses and ask them about what's most important to them. And we try to go to folks who don't always vote or they don't always vote our way and have conversations there. And that helps us to get the kind of like local intelligence that can really supercharge a campaign to connect directly to what's already you know, inside people's minds. I think a lot of times for, for Democrats who feel very passionately about the, the things that make us get involved, we sort of think if we can just convince people and show them why we're right about stuff, that'll bring them over to our side. But so much more, it's about actually tuning into where people are right now and then meeting them in that place. So our strategy has been to build local teams all over the state of people in their own communities 
and then organize very early door-to-door canvases and phone banks and all the other stuff where we're just asking people questions and tuning into them instead of trying to sell them something, uh, you know, before we know where they're starting. And, and that is the kind of foundation that we try to build everything on. And Lavor, I want to I want to kind of come to you because you have uh, just uh, no offense to anyone else, but the the best statewide elected, uh, just rock star uh, uh, elected officials. Uh, that that's that's uh, no no jab at my own governor, who I absolutely love. But but I, I'm wondering how uh, how you have been able to capitalize on that, right? Yeah while also dealing with some of the just horrid reality right. uh, that, that, that exists uh, on the ground in, in some of the, the really red meat part of, uh, of, of Michigan. Yeah, I, I would say that you, you can't beat those women from Michigan. There is no beating them, no matter how hard you might try. Um, and my advice to anyone who wants to do this is to get terrific candidates like those to step up and run, because it does make your life so much easier. And I will tell you this, because we have a governor who's not afraid to go to any part of the state and do what Ben just said, listen, and have conversations with folks, it makes a huge difference and it makes my life easier. Like when, when I say to her, the folks in the UP would love to hear from you, you know what she does? She gets in a car and she goes to the UP and she listens to what they have to say. And that's a big part of making my job easier. If I didn't have that terrific governor in place to do that, um, I wouldn't do that. But here's the other thing. Brave is hell. We talked about cursing earlier, but this is a woman who continues to do that work while people are threatening her life. While the madness that's happening here on the ground in Michigan has gotten so bad that threats to the governor's life have become um, almost, you know, passe. Also, almost we are used to it because it happens and that's ridiculous. But what we do is we use all of it as an organizing touch point, as a conversation that we are having with the voters about what's happening in Michigan. It makes it so much easier when we go into a red community and say, is this what you want from your nation? Is this what you want from your state? This is not me having an argument with you about whether or not you think it's okay that the governor asked people to mandate wearing masks. By the way, it is okay. Um, but that's not the conversation. The conversation is, do you care about the health and safety of your children? Do you wanna live in a state where people will actually threaten the life of the governor and have very little to nothing happen from the Republican party? Is that what you want? Do you want a Republican chair who actually thinks that we should be burning the governor, the attorney general and the secretary of state at the stake? Do we think that's right? And that opens up a conversation that we can have with voters about what they would like to see in their communities, what they would like to see in their state. And really it brings them toward that middle, right? Because they understand that this Republican party here in Michigan has gone so far to the right that they no longer represent that. So we've, we've I know Ben's done this too. We've expanded our targets, folks. Like we, we now talk to more Republican leaning voters than we ever had before, because we know that there's a conversation to be had there about what they want to see for their future, what they want to see for their children, what they believe in and what they believe their state can be. Um, and as long as we're having those conversations and we have a governor we can point to and say, this is what happens when Democrats lead, as opposed to what happens when Republicans lead, when we can point to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and say, this is what happens when you elect Democrats. It makes it so much easier to have that conversation in those red communities. And, you know, here in Michigan, just like Ben does, we do it everywhere. There's not a part of this state we don't organize. We've got a program we call Project 83, which is named for the 83 counties of Michigan. We do not let any community go unorganized, any door unknocked, any voter untalked to, um, because there is something to be said to each and every one of them. You just have to know what it is and you have to find it. We're all about finding those folks and having those good conversations. And, and Madam Chair, I think that's such a, a great point that uh, th there's this misconception out there that we as Democrats just focus on democratic areas and we just kind of <laughs> let let other places Can't. go. But but it really is a strategy, uh, a, a, an intentional strategy uh, of ours. And I, I, I feel like I can safely say that uh, uh, across the spectrum uh, that we don't take any place for granted and, and we may we may get it handed to us you know, for showing up, but but we'll at least contest it. Uh, we'll we'll make inroads where we can because we do recognize uh, that one uh, Democrats actually are everywhere, uh, but also that the Republican overreach uh, mm -hmm. has given us an opportunity uh, to have conversations with some folks. I, I I always use the example of my mother-in-law, who when I I met wasn't concerned that I was black. She was much more concerned that I was a Democrat. 
uh, and you look ahead <laughs> 17, 18 years later, um, she's still a Republican, but, but barely. Uh, and and she's much more willing now to have conversations about what the Democratic Party stands for because uh, the the party is just uh, well that that's a whole different conversation. But one uh, that I, I think Jamar, you probably know well, even being sixty days in uh, to to your current position uh, in in Texas, uh, you have uh, you have had to hit the ground running. <laughs> So, so talk to us a little bit about what those 60 days have been like and, and what it is like now uh, on the ground there in Texas, uh, growing a party uh, in the midst of uh, what is clearly a, a, a moment of, of national reckoning uh, for Texas, but, but uh, statewide reckoning as well. Yeah, Coleman, I think you hit the nail right on the head, right? We've had to do, we've had to walk and chew gum. Uh, at the same time as Democrats in Texas. And I'm assuming that has happening across the South. Um, we, you know, we don't have a big Gretsch yet in Texas. Uh, we're, we're working on getting um, our statewide um, elected. Um, but one of the things I think that's important is my first day on the job, Democratic legislators said, we're getting on the plane, we're going to DC, we're advocating. And two days later, I was in DC. <laughs> um, and so I don't think that that is a normal onboarding for anyone. Um, not that I'm recommending <laughs> that. <laughs> but, but one of the things I think that's important is, is, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, what we have to show people as Democrats, especially in Southern states, we have to show people that they're going to be heard. Um, I, this weekend, I actually traveled with uh, our chairman and our vice chair and other Democrats to Laredo, Texas, which is 20 minutes from the border. We went to Webb County and we literally went and I, someone asked a question in the chat about COVID. I mean, we're requiring masks, we're requiring vaccination um, proof um, at our events. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that we have learned in Texas is we've got to go to the people and we've got to be able to take this party to the people and really talk about the issues that people are talking about on their front porches, at their kitchen tables, in the cars, riding down the road. And sometimes I think that Democrats in the South, we've lost a little bit of that. People are trying to decide how to pay for their prescription. People are deciding what to do about Republican governors who are saying to school boards, you don't have to require masks. Um, we're talking about the safety of our children. Um, and so what we're dealing with in Texas is how do we build the infrastructure with Democrats and an infrastructure meaning that people are well-trained, well-resourced, but also well-messaged. Um, and one of the things is, is that, you know, as you mentioned in the very first question, Coleman, right, that we have a, a very diverse party, um, you know, as well. And one of the things is, is that our party, the Democratic Party is representative of the democracy that we're fighting for. Um, and so one of the pieces that for us is that we've been having to have some intentional conversations of when we talk to people in South Texas, uh, the message is slightly different in East Texas and slightly different in West Texas. But what we're coming together to say in these listening conversations is at the end of the day, Democrats save lives and Democrats are working to make lives better for people. Um, and that has struck everywhere. Right. You can be in Lubbock. You can be in El Paso. You can be in Austin. You can be in um, Brownsville. You can be anywhere in the state, because ultimately, at the end of the day, the attacks that we're seeing at the federal level, Texas has been the battleground. When we look at voter suppression, when we look at um, restricting access to abortion care, when we're banning critical race theory and whitewashing history, uh, Texas has been the battleground for that. And so our messaging has been able to improve because we have gone to our communities taking our party to the people and not wait for the party, the people to come to the party. Um, and we're seeing that, that shift and we're seeing that change as well. The other piece that's important for us is making sure that we're working with um, our county chairs. We're working with precinct chairs across the state on messaging and media training. But we're, we just did a training, for example, last week on how to navigate redistricting in your communities. Because one of the things that's important when we're talking about finding people to run everywhere is how are we part of the conversation of how those districts are drawn for people to run in in the first place? Um, so we're actually, we've hired consultants to work with our county chairs actually to be able to look at what do school board lines look like so that we can engage teachers in running. What do county council and county commission uh, seats look like where small business owners can run and help manage counties um, across the state or our county executive races, right? 
And so it's also not just about saying that we need more Democrats to run for office and run campaigns and hire people from those communities. It's also about how we create that democracy and how we build a strategy and build lines for them to have a chance uh, to fight in. And so that's something that we're doing new um, here in Texas is making sure that as part of that representative democracy, people actually have an opportunity to actually run for those seats. And we're not just running around asking people to run. We're actually saying we've helped to fight for fair lines and we want you to run for these seats. And so I think those are some key things that we've been able to do. And our chairman, our vice chair, myself, our staff, in a COVID safe manner, have been able to travel the state. Um, we were able to be part of the Build Back Better bus tour. Um, we visited with faith leaders in four counties um, recently. Um, and so it's taking this party to the people and reminding people that we're saving lives in this country and we're working to make lives better through our policies. Jamar, absolutely. And uh, you, it, you can't see this probably, but uh, you're getting a lot of uh, uh, claps and, and hands up in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for everything that you're doing. And 60 days in, even. <laughs> that, that's a lot. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Time flies when you're having fun. It's fun. It, 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 well, and, and, and no one has, I think, more fun being a, 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 being a chair uh, than, than Trav. Uh, so, uh, at least he makes it look fun on, 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 our, on our call. So Trav, talk to us a little bit uh, about what's going on in South Carolina. Uh, obviously, it's a state that has, uh, like Kentucky, kind of done this pendulum swing. But, uh, but, it's, but the, the, the party, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think I shared this with you, I, I go to South Carolina at least once or twice uh, every year, but the party seems to be catching on to, to something. Uh, what do you think that something is? And, and knowing you, it's been intentional. So, so talk to us a little bit about that intentional strategy of, of how you're connecting to people and, and building back uh, in South Carolina. Well, I, I think one of the interesting things is, uh, unlike uh, the other parties represented here, we don't register by party. There's no party registration in South Carolina. And so that means that when you're running a campaign or you're targeting for a race, you actually have to go in to look at voting habits or voting patterns of precincts or, or our um, you know, specific voters. And I think what, what you find here is we're the party that doesn't exclude anybody. One of the most interesting things I had was a fight on the floor of our convention over to let an individual have a three minute speech, uh, who was someone who had run as a Republican and switched to run as a Democrat. And I, you know, and, and that was a fight we had on the floor. But the, the larger issue is this, is that the messaging has to change. And what I mean by that is, is that what happens in Greenville, South Carolina, an hour and a half up the road here, is not necessarily going to be the same thing that happens in Aiken or the needs to happen in Aiken or Williamsburg or Beaufort, South Carolina. And so we, as, as party folks, while we want people to accept every single core value that we have and agree with us on every single word, we have to understand that that's not going to resonate with every specific voter. Uh, and, and to the larger part is we're trying to change the actual vernacular, the, the language. You know, there's a, a tomorrow morning I will go on a, 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 the, one of the largest Christian radio stations at 830 in the morning in South Carolina. And I, there, there's it's an interesting we started last week with this and it, we're just getting into the, the meat of our conversation. But last week they talked about mask mandates and a poll that came out. And the simple truth of that poll was they weren't testing the issue. They were testing the word requirement as opposed to mandate. Independent and swing voters in a state like South Carolina support a requirement, but they're adamantly opposed to a mandate. And so the fact is, is that we have to learn how to communicate you know, Jamar, and, and I see Brandon Upson's on here, who's in charge of one of our caucuses, but they actually talked about going to where the voters live. But we, at the same time, have to change the way in which we speak to voters. And that actually, it's kind of like the difference between $20 and 
If there weren't a psychological significance, advertisers wouldn't use it. It has been tested and tested. And so, you know, Lakoff and, and some of the other writers who've talked about this, there's no, there's no doubt about changing the vernacular. And, and I, I have had, and I want to point out that I did not curse first on this Zoom. It was the, the gentle chairwoman from Michigan. But anyway, the, you know, when we were having the debate, in the legislature over the fetal heartbeat bill. And they refused to allow exceptions for victims of rape and incest. I picked up the phone and recorded a robocall and sent it into every single woman in the female voter in the Republican male districts to let them know that they supported the rights of rapists and pedophiles over the rights of victims. You would be shocked at just changing that up how effective it was in getting the attention of those legislators. Because think about it. We've got people who believe in the commandments, but they supported a man that cheated on his wife with a porn star. And when you couch the debate like that and you change the vernacular, when you say, you know what, you're not for these exemptions, but you support the rights of pedophiles and rapists over the rights of their victims, that changes people's minds when you start talking about that. And so primarily those of us, we are simply trying to uh, make sure that our candidates uh, change the vernacular and the way in which they speak to candidates. And, and that's something, but here's the deal. You have to have buy-in from your county party chairs. You have to have buy-in from your caucus chairs, your precinct presidents. You, we have now become, and I, I'm speaking for all of our panelists, I think, we've become the leaders of organizations that have to be something or find a way to say yes to everybody. And as a result, that means, you know, trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. So right now, the sexy thing is voter registration. How do you have a voter registration program that's cost efficient, that's effective, because Stacey Abrams is not the norm. That's the exception to raising money for a program. A God lover, I'm for 100%. But also voter protection, making sure that we've got a staff on the ground getting ready to do the organizing and trying to figure out how to navigate COVID again. So, and, and then you've got, you know, you want to do trainings for county party folks, for precinct officers, you want to fill precinct slots. So that's the simple thing. And, and, and I think, all of this has to have buy-in from local county folks in order to be successful. And so I think when I became chairman, that was one of the first things I tried to do was to listen to what those needs of our people that we were expecting to implement the programs that we were trying to do. And I, and I just can't uh, applaud them enough. I mean, we don't give them the resources that they need near enough, but by God, they, they do a, a, a great job in trying to fulfill that need for us. And, and so, you know, but it's all about the vernacular and the psychology. I mean, uh, you know, Steve Spurrier came to the University of South Carolina and said, I'm not here to create a winning culture. I'm here to change the psychology of the fan base. Well, we're still losing. Uh, wait, don't we play Kentucky this weekend? I don't need to talk no. about that, but yes. <laughs> Maybe that's next weekend. I don't remember. But anyway, the point I'm making is, is that being the party that wants to say yes and help everybody, we've got to figure creative ways. We've got to think outside the box, but we also have to change psychology and vernacular. That, that, that's so true. And um, one of the ways that, that we see that happening, and, and Madam Chair, I'm going to come back to, to you a question from, from one of our uh, audience members, uh, Christine, uh, ask to, to, if you can go into a little bit more detail about how when, when uh, the, the governor goes into red districts mm -hmm. um, and, and the party goes into to red mm -hmm. districts, uh, what do those events look like? What are those conversations like with folks on the ground? Um, how, how do you... Uh, are they more persuasive or, or are they just listening? You know, how, how do you, you kind of go as, as Travis saying and, and change 
uh, you know, kind of change hearts and minds, but first yeah. change how people even talk about yeah. uh, what it is to be a Democrat and, and to be a part of this party. Yeah, I will start by first, thanks for the question, Christine. It's a great question. Um, the, the, the first step to this is the groundwork that we lay by doing grassroots organizing all over the state, everywhere. So by the, but when the governor or any candidate has shown up in a part of this, this state, we have done some work on that ground already. We have had the conversations that Ben is talking about having in Wisconsin. We've asked people, what are the issues that matter to you? What's important to you? What, what drives your decision-making when you show up at the polling place? That way we can tailor our conversations around those issues. And I have to tell you, this is my big plug. I say it to every county leader I talk to, local, local, local. Folk, folks want to talk about the issues that matter to them at home. It could be as big as, you know, mask mandates and what's happening in their school or as small as the stoplight down on the corner. But it's a local issue and they care about it. And that's the big thing that's on their minds. And when you go to the door and you start a conversation by talking about something big and global that doesn't feel local to them, you've already got their eyes glazed over. Right? They want to hear that you know what matters to them in their local community and you talk to them about those issues. So that's what the governor does so incredibly well, is that she goes into these communities understanding what is the issue of the day, what is the thing that concerns the folks in this community the most right now, and she talks about it and she speaks to it and she answers questions about it. And I think the other big thing we do, we do a lot of events, uh, again, COVID safe, it's changed a little bit the way we do things, but a lot of time where folks have a, a chance to interact, which I think you know, you can't always do and not all of your candidates will have the time to have those interactive conversations. But when folks have an opportunity to ask and get answers to questions, it makes a big difference in their decision making around what kind of relationship do I have with this candidate and can I vote for her? her, I said, him or her. Um, so, so what we encourage and what we do are those conversations, the listening first, and then the conversations about the issues that are important locally. Um, and sometimes it is a statewide issue. Sometimes it is a national issue. COVID, of course, comes up everywhere we go. But oftentimes, you know, people here want to talk about what's happening with the water in Michigan. People want to talk about the roads, which our governor is fixing those damn roads, in case you were wondering. Um, all of those things, I know twice, Travis counting. Um, but, but the conversations need to be local and about the issues that folks care about. And, and Ben, you have, uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Ben, you, you've spent uh, an entire career uh, fighting for economic, social, racial justice. That is so intertwined with, I, I think, at our best, who we, who we want to be as a party. How do you have those kinds of conversations in, in rural uh, Wisconsin? How, how, how do you have those conversations that are so, uh, again, we, we hope and we work towards it being core to who we are as Democrats, but have been so weaponized that they become really divisive and, and sometimes hard to have in, in some of our red areas. Uh, how do you have those kinds of persuasive conversations uh, in, in those districts, staying true to who we are as Democrats, uh, but also opening the, the, the doors to the, to the church, if you will, uh, so that folks know that they're, they're, they're welcome too. Um, well, it, it's such a key question. And I think Democrats often have this idea that if you don't talk about something, no one's gonna think about that thing. And so sometimes you get these you know, Democratic candidates who think they can go and you know, talk about how we want healthcare for everyone and we want to make sure everyone has good jobs and maybe Republicans won't try to gin up racism this time and try to diminish support for things that benefit people across, across lines of race. I will tell you in Wisconsin, every single campaign, Republicans resort to the same playbook. And this is a very white state, about nine out of 10 voters in Wisconsin are white. Uh, Republicans always end the campaign by trying to convince white voters that Democrats are trying to get a benefit for someone who doesn't look like them and it's not going to benefit them. And the way that we try to tackle that is with a, a framework called the race class narrative. It's something that uh, Heather McGee, who wrote this extraordinary book called The Sum of Us, writes about very powerfully, uh, worked with Ian Haney Lopez and Anat Shankar Osorio to develop a framework where you essentially, you talk to voters and you say, look, whether you're white, black, or brown, you want, we all want good schools where our kids get a great public education, but there are some people who try to divide us by race 
in order to distract us while they rip all the funding out of our public schools and give it to the people at the very top. And so we need to come together to counter that uh, so that you know all of our kids get the education they need to succeed. You point out what the other side is doing, how they're intentionally dividing people. And that's something that that just resonates. It makes sense. We had a, we actually had a training for all of our county party chairs and most of our you know counties or rural counties in Wisconsin, where uh, a not uh, from the race class narrative project laid out this this uh, system of communicating where you explain and point out what the other side is doing, trying to divide people, and you the heads were going like this. Everyone was nodding because we've all seen this play out everywhere we live across our state, and so it means having the the kind of you know, practicing and being ready to talk about how the other side uses race in order to diminish the power that we have when we come together across race to make things better for everyone. That's the way that, that we approach it. And we're working now to train candidates, to train uh, folks who are staffing on campaigns, because often, you know, if you're a political operative, you want to steer your candidate away from talking about something uh, that might get people upset. But pointing out how Republicans divide people is the way to, to defang this Republican attack that they use over and over and over again. Absolutely. And I, I want to turn to, uh, to, to both Trav and Jamar, two, uh, two campaign vets. Uh, when, when we think about recruiting candidates, right, to, to run in some of these districts that, that uh, both uh, Lavora and, and Ben have talked about. What are some of the, what are, what are some of the, the things that, that you kind of point them to and, and, and away from in terms of not only how they co communicate, but how they connect with, with folks? Uh, you know, we, we always hear, we've got to build a bench, we've got to build a bench. Uh, but that's that's always, you know, let me just editorialize for a second. That's always harder to, to, to do than most people because you, you you have folks tell you to do that. And then you ask them if they want to run and they're like, no, 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 I, I didn't mean me. Uh, but but, you know, in terms of when you when you do have candidates and you are in the middle of, of uh, a campaign, whether it's statewide or for a local race or somewhere in between, uh, what are some of the things that you point them to and from uh, in having those kinds of conversations with folks on the ground and connecting with folks, especially in those uh, red and often rural districts? Um, uh, Trav, what? Well, I mean, I, I, I think sense. Kick, kick that off. Coleman, if I, if I think that what you're asking is, is how we don't alienate our base while also being open to bringing independent swing voters or moderate Republicans. So I think that's absolutely, amazing. absolutely. And, and, you know, it is, it is a fascinating conundrum and it is a, you know, it is one in the South, as some of you will say, it, it can be tinged with race. Uh, it can be tinged with socioeconomic issues as well and rural versus urban. Um, I, it is, it is not an easy answer, frankly. And I do think that in a place like South Carolina, our state is divided up into four areas. Uh, you've got the upstate, which is along the I-85 corridor that connects Atlanta, Greenville, Spartanburg, and Charlotte. You've got the PD, uh, which is an old agrarian, uh, the last vestiges of tobacco and cotton. You've got the Midlands, where the state capital. And then you've got the low country, which is Charleston and some of the rural counties there. It's agrarian and tourist based. And, and so it's not necessarily, uh, but what I do think is this is a key to all of it. And that is, is that there's no doubt that we have to have a fundamentally good ground game going into it to motivate our voters to vote. But I think in South Carolina, there are two things that are happening. One is, is that Democrats have to quit assuming, and I say this with all the whiteness in the world, we have to quit assuming that African-Americans in a state like South Carolina are monolithic voters. They're not. That day has come and gone. And as a result of that, if you're not making an investment in communicating in communities of color early on in your campaign, they're, they're not going to be with you when it's time to come vote. And I think that we're seeing that time and time again. But I think the real fundamental answer to your question is that we as Democrats allow our weaknesses 
to be weaknesses. As opposed to our opponents, Republicans, they look at their weaknesses and they figure out how to turn it to a strength. And I, I, there's a glaring there, there's a glaring example or two examples. One is is in 2010 we were running the governor's race in South Carolina, and you know Chuck Todd comes on at midnight and says the surprise upset may be that Vincent Shaheen, a Democrat, wins in South Carolina. We lost by about 59,000 votes. But I was the only person involved in a campaign that year that wanted to bring President Barack Obama to South Carolina. Everybody says, are you crazy? Are you nuts? And I simply said, listen, they're going to use the Affordable Care Act against us. They're going to use President Obama against us. Let's bring him here, show that he's not the Antichrist, and use him to raise the money that we need to combat what they're going to say anyway. And, and, and then, you know, last year, the year before, uh, I asked the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who they demonize in every election cycle. And I asked her to come to Greenville, South Carolina. And Greenville, South Carolina is where Bob Jones University, Furman University, Greenville Baptist College is. And I brought her there for a very specific reason. I wanted the business community to understand that when the Republicans who represented the business interest up there refused to do anything to help, that Jim Clyburn and Nancy Pelosi were the go-to people to get what they needed accomplished, not the Republicans. And and it was a, a largely successful event, but it was trying to turn a perceived weakness into a strength. And we as Democrats can no longer... We have we've done five town hall meetings in South Carolina, specifically with local elected officials, specifically designed to tell what money is coming from the American Rescue Plan and the proposed infrastructure bill to show these folks that the Democrats are bringing money into their communities. When you get into a rural town and these folks have no idea they're getting $10 million and it hadn't been allotted by a city council or a county council, you can just see the look of astonishment on their face. You know, when you talk about the fact that it will take $6 billion to do all of the repairs to the system that brings clean drinking water to every single South Carolinian, and that the infrastructure bill in the American Rescue Plan will provide the seed money to start that process, it makes a hell of a difference. And you can see it in some of these folks' eyes. I mean, we were in a, a small city, Batesburg, Leesville. It's got great barbecue, um, but they're a little Republican. But uh, you, this, this, so we're, we're down there. Two weeks later, one of the guys running for mayor has another and, and says, everybody bring your plans. We're going to collect the plans and we're going to present them to the city manager. And I think that that's, you know, those couple of things. So while people are critical of this alleged government overreach, at the end of the day, it's simply because they haven't been educated. And we've got to turn our weaknesses into strengths and, and quit letting them define who we are. I, I, I will tell you all just so you get a little backdrop in, in terms of uh, uh, conversations that we have as, as state leaders. Uh, Trav says that almost so uh, Southern Southern uh, chairs get together uh, about once a week. He says this almost every call. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's a true. change for me. That is a change. For me. You know, someone on um, uh, in the thread asked, how do you target voters? I mean, I think Jamar and, and uh, several others on here will tell you, I look at targeting as, um, as brain surgery. You know, if you, God forbid, you've got a tumor in your head, you don't want me cutting you open, rooting around in there. You want a surgeon that's got a godlike complex to go in and excise the tumor and sew you up so you can be on your way. And sometimes, you know, when we recruit candidates, we've had that surgical approach my mindset has changed on that. We, we have to take the fight to them in every nook and cranny. And, and I will say the meeting of expectations is, is a little overwhelming at times. Um, people have to realize in South Carolina that we increased our share of the electorate by almost, the general election electorate by almost uh, 600,000 votes. Think about that. 
Donald Trump was on the ticket and we increased our share of the general election electorate by almost 600,000 votes. We didn't win everything, but by God saying that we were able to do that gives us an opportunity going into a non-presidential cycle when we've got a U.S. Senate primary and a potential primary for governor. And, and that's, that's what we all have to remember is that, you know, we can't be like Chairwoman Barnes and get it right on the first, first go. <laughs> so, J- Jamar, oh, Jamar. T- t- talk, talk. Love talk you, Trav. There's a lot of love, lots of love. Uh, I, I know we've got just a few minutes left, but uh, Jamar, I, I wonder uh, if you can talk about why it's so incredibly important uh, to have a uh, have collaboration between state parties uh, in doing this work. Um, understanding that, again, I, I know you've been on board 60 days, but you've been involved in this work uh, as, as long as I have. Uh, and if you could explain a little bit of, of why it's so incredibly important that we not have these conversations in a vacuum, but how we're able to, to kind of work collaboratively, whether it's regionally or, or just, uh, you know, writ large. Uh, h- how, how is that helpful to, to Texas Democrats right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, if I can just touch on the last question just a little absolutely. bit, we um, have uh, time constraints um, because the conversation is so rich, we, don't, we run out of time. Uh, but one of the things I think that's also important, you know, to what Trav was saying, he was giving us the roadmap to not operate in fear. And one of the things that we've got to learn as Democrats, wherever we are in this country, is we can't operate in fear, right? But it is hard in what people would deem red states, um, red counties, red areas. It is difficult, and we need to give them as much love um, as possible. But one of the things that, you know, for example, that work for us are two things. Uh, back in 2018, we were able to flip 12 House seats um, in Texas and move to single digits in the Texas House because we dared to run people. We found uh, people who would run for those offices. And a lot of them had lost the cycle before. And so the thing that we've got to think about when we are going into red areas is you may not win the first time. You may have to win the second time, right? And build an infrastructure, build a message, build relationships and build connections to be able to go into another cycle. And so I think that we run for office because we want to win and sure, we should we should want to win. But if we don't win, what is after the election? Um, and that's what we've got to learn to start operating in some of the red areas that in rural areas that, that we're talking about. And so I think that that's important. So for example, last month we had a special election for a state house seat in, um, El- in Henderson and Ellis counties, which is uh, Northwest Texas. Um, And we ran, it was a nine way race. It was a jungle primary. And we had one Democrat out of the nine. That one Democrat, no one had run for that office as a Democrat since like 2010, 2012, 2014, somewhere in there. And we got third place in that election. And we got third place because we were able to get counties excited um, and be able to work on phone banks. They were doing text banks and doing those things. You can never, as someone said, don't throw in the towel because you never know what the shift might be. Some of the political dynamics may play in your favor. And we're actually having conversations with her about what it looks like to run next cycle. And so we've got to make sure that we keep these conversations going that yes, even if someone loses, don't throw them away. And we do a bad job of that sometimes. Oh, you didn't win. We won't talk to you. Let's go find somebody else. No, let's run you again because now you have something to build on. And so I think we've got to start thinking about that and being more intentional, especially I mean, what we would deem as red states. But one of the things I think that's also important about what Trav said, but also what Ben brought up, especially around the race uh, class narrative is one of the things when we look at red districts, a lot of people assume that red areas are just rural. And that's not, and because of gerrymandering, that's not always true. Also, when we look at people who are in red districts, they're black people, they're brown people, they're white people, they're um, indigenous people, uh, there's young people, there's older people, right? They're teachers, they're small business owners. And so we've got to stop making assumptions about who's in those districts. And a lot of times we assume in those districts, they're just white conservative voters. And they're actually people who are representative of our party that are in those districts that don't have representation because no one runs. They don't have a voice at the ballot box because no one runs. And so we've got to give our Democrats, our different demographics in these communities, 
an opportunity to have a say in who represents them. And so that race class piece is important because we assume just white people live in rural areas of the country, and that's not true. And so we've got to kind of challenge our own um, thinking around that. Um, but the, to the piece with what you're saying, Coleman, about why it's important to work together is I want to learn from Chairwoman Barnes and Ben, right? They've done something that works. <laughs> Um, and so one of the pieces I think that's important that we have to all learn as leaders, even as executive director now, is I still am learning and growing and building in these roles. And I think that we assume that the state party chairs and the state party executive directors are supposed to know it all. Um, and these opportunities of collaboration allows us to say, hey, I'm facing this challenge in my state. How have you navigated that? So, for example, today um, we have a Democratic executive, uh, executive directors Google group, and we're and there was one state that was trying to say, we want to start offering people 401ks to work at the party. And we started a conversation about saying, yeah, because we bring people into these Democratic Party organizations and we treat the Democratic Party organizations such as campaigns. And they're not campaigns, right? Our party should be organizing 365 days a year. Now we work with campaigns, but the party is not a campaign. Right. And so now the people that had, are signing up to say, yes, I want to strengthen our party. I want to make our party better. How are we treating them? Right. And so thinking about how people can save, how people can invest in themselves, how people can invest in their families while we're saying as the Democratic Party, we're the party that's investing in people, but making sure that we're living our values in the party. But being able to have that collaboration allows us to have that space. But it also allows us to grow. It allows us to make mistakes together. It allows us to throw shade at each other, you know, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> because, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, our party comes together because we've got to remember our party's from the ground up. And so how are local folks working together? How are states working together? Because that makes up our national party. So when we're competing in uh, U.S. Senate elections, presidential elections, we have built this party from the bottom up. And so those conversations are absolutely vital that conversation sharing, sharing templates, sharing resources um, wherever possible. Because one of the beauties of what this collaboration meant was when our D members went to DC, we had so many state parties, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Colorado, I mean, I can name them all, Vermont even, you know, we had parties all over the country say, how can we help you out? And people were, we were raising money all over the country to make sure that those members can sit in the halls of power to ensure that we are moving legislation forward. And that's because we're building those relationships and those avenues of communication. Um, and so we've got to make sure that if we're going to keep the White House, that we pick up governor seats, that we pick up state legislatures, it's not going to be done by one party versus another state, one state party versus another state party. It's only going to be done together. And so I always appreciate these folks um, on the screen and other folks that just when everything's blowing up in Texas, because it's Texas, people pick up the phone and say, how can we help? What can we do? And they're always there. And for us, you know, to be able to be in a space to be able to do that too. And that is important. And we've got to make sure we build together. Well, am I allowed to ask you a question, Coleman? Well, we have, we have one minute. So. Well, you've got a democratic governor in a Southern state. Tell us how you did it. Uh, a lot. Uh, that, that is way more time. That took may, may, way more time. But a lot of what was said today, I mean, that 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 organizing on the ground, that that uh, talking, changing the, the the tone and tenor of the conversation. A lot of things that you all touched on today is is, is what Andy Bashir did, what the party did, what we're continuing to do as, as we uh, now enter in uh, a, a three year cycle. So I, I wish I could say more, but. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Chairwoman LaVara Barnes, uh, Chairman Trav Robertson, Chairman Ben Wickler, and Executive Director Jamar Brown. They, I told you they would be a dynamic panel. Everyone, if you could please take a moment and fill out the, uh, the survey that is in the chat box. We, we want to hear your feedback. I told you an hour wasn't going to be enough. We should take this on the road, guys. I'm just going to throw that out there to NDTC. We've got so much more coming uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Q&A on relational organizing. Uh, we've got relational organizing to drive your campaign goals. I mean, just so much that, uh, that NDTC staff has put together uh, an all-star group of folks that are coming in tomorrow. And you do not want to miss on Friday, September 24th at 2 p.m., 
uh, our final closing event with NDTC Honorary Co-Chair and U.S. Representative, my friend and sister, Nakima Williams. If you don't know her, you should. Uh, so with that, uh, Colin, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your evening. Panelists, thank you all so much for being the dynamic leaders Great. and Democrats you that you are. Thank you all Colin. so much. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kelly Dietrich, the CEO and founder of the National Democratic Training Committee. For more like this, head on over to traindemocrats.org. Thanks for watching.